fuck even is this cold opening? I don't even know what I'm doing anymore. So, that they're Dark Souls, huh? Hell of a game, innit? People, y'all know me. I have two big obsessions that I am just all about. Music and video games. Three if you want to count Simpsons up to around season 12 to 14. But yeah, I told you guys that with the rebrand, non-rock music related long form content was coming and here we go. After putting it to a nail-bitingly close vote, seriously, no love for Christopher Guest here? Y'all are missing out, you should see that movie. I had a hit that you might have heard of, Hurileget Little Goman, which means how's it hanging grandma? And y'all decided you wanted to praise the motherfucking sun. Dorks. But no, I love the Souls series. These games have to be some of my favorite games of the last decade. Nearly every title in From Software's iconic series is simply spellbinding. Many of these works have straight up redefined the gaming landscape for years and years to come. But holy sh Yet do these games have a barrier to entry. Yeah, people, even though I'm a huge fan, even I can admit that if you're having trouble getting into this series, I get it. Believe me, I get it. I so completely understand your plight here. I mean, there's just no easy way to put it. These games are notorious for pushing people away with their esoteric nature, their blood Hissingly hard difficulty, and not to mention a fan base that can at times really afford to take a chill pill. Just saying, right there. I say that as a Souls guy myself, but you know, even I can confess we trash. But that's why I wanted to make this video to give those of you out there who have been curious but haven't been able to get around to it or have been intimidated by it, just a very brief, very loose guide into getting into the Souls series. In this video, we're only going to cover the official FromSoft titles that count in the generally agreed upon Souls canon, so games from From Software. God, that's not awkward to say. And also, I want to make this clear. This isn't going to be a knockdown, drag out, super detailed nitpick fest of each individual game of the series. We don't have time for that. And if you want something like that, there are entire channels devoted to stuff like that. My videos are already long enough as it is. If I get into deep souls lore, I'm never gonna stop talking. But for those of you who want to have just some idea of how to get started with this series, I'll be happy to give you my tips on how to get into Dark Souls. Okay, okay. Some of you might be confused right now. The first one? Crash? Really? Even after that review you did on the remaster a while back where you said it had tons of quality of life issues and has aged kind of badly and yada yada yada? Yes, really. I am totally putting this on here. Let me explain. Out of all of the official games in the Souls canon, I actually played the game that more or less started the whole series off dead last. Well, no, actually, I tell a lie. I actually did play OG Dark Souls way back in the day, back when it originally came out on PS3. But I did the worst possible thing you can do with a game like this. I rented it. Yep, I rented Dark Souls. Not even through Gamefly or long-term lending or anything like that. No, family videos are still a fairly big thing here in the Midwest. 
I have no idea how, but yeah, they're still kicking around. I went to an honest to God brick and mortar rental store, took it out for three days, got my ass smeared by the Taurus demon, and was like, okay, no, thank you, back to infamous for me. Oh, this, this, this is much more comfortable, man. Oh, look at this. Uh, I'm living and not dying and check out my zappy hands. This is a good game. When are we getting another infamous? But yeah, that initial humbling was what kept me away from the original game for a very long time. It wasn't until I got a chance to play later titles in the series that this one eventually clicked for me. I only came back to this one with the benefit of hindsight of pretty much every other game and yeah, I have to be real with you. Having played all of the other games before this, certain things really do stick out. It can be a really demanding, really fussy game at times. Oh, you have two hands that each have five fingers? Two ring slots only. And some of the rings break if you ever, ever take them off. Fuck you. Oh, you want to fast travel between each location because there's a decent amount of running around and backtracking in this game? Beat half the game first! And the item that lets you do that is behind a totally unfair two-on-one fight that's considered one of the toughest in the entire series. Then we'll let you warp between some of the bonfires. Fuck you. You want to steal yourself out with the best possible armor and adequately defend yourself? You get over encumbered at 50% of your carry limit. And we won't tell you what percentage you're at. Do the math in your head. Fuck you. Y'all get what I'm trying to say here, right? If you've had the chance to play a Souls game, or even a Souls-like, and you're used to more of those little conveniences that other games like that may have offered you, a lot of that stuff isn't in this game. And again, I completely understand why in the face of all those intimidating and uncomfortable prospects that a game like the original Dark Souls probably feels like a great big middle finger coated into a Blu-ray disc. Honestly, that was the way I felt when I first played it for those three days. You know, I get how it can be so intimidating, but still. I'm honestly, sincerely recommending that if you can, if you can at least, you really should start with this game. Because if you can make it through this, with all of its grumps and gripes and hair pulling moments, if you can tackle this game, the rest of the series just opens up for you. The world of Dark Souls is vast, open-ended, and absolutely fascinating. The story and lore is one of the most engaging things in all of gaming, in my opinion. It's very cryptic, but also extremely tragic, elegant, and downright poetic when it wants to be. Some of the best stories in gaming start with this title. And while you don't have to play these games in any specific order to necessarily what's going on in each game individually, they're not interconnected like that, if you do start here, so many of the other games, more notable callbacks, themes, and references to each other will strike such a larger chord with you when they do happen. I don't want to get into graphic detail, again I don't have time and I don't want to spoil any of this for you, but it can genuinely get to you if you've had the proper introduction, and here is where the proper introductions start. Again, I, I don't want to spoil anything for you, but the best tip I can give you without too many spoilers, you see an onion? You help that onion. The onion is a good boy. The onion is best boy. The best thing you can do in this game is roleplay as Shrek. Onions! You don't necessarily have to start here, and like I said, it's not even the way I started with this series, and I still managed, but when I did finally go back to play this game, after playing all the others, there were so many moments where upon playing this game I was like, Oh, so that's why that happened! Oh, I get it! Oh, wow, that's, that's like a thing? Oh, that's neat. Holy cow, I didn't get that that was a thing. And that's a thing. 
And this bald guy is a fucking prick. I love him. And also, if you start here, not only are you preparing yourself for the story and the lore in the best possible way, you're also preparing your play style as well. Yeah, this game is tough. It's probably the least accommodating game in the series. Almost. But almost every other game in this series basically builds upon this title as a framework. Except for this one, I, we're getting to it. If you can master this title, then the other games will click into place for you so exceptionally smoothly. If you can make it through this one, the other games won't give you nearly as much trouble. Just period. Playing this game before the others is kind of like learning guitar before you learn a similar instrument like the bass or the ukulele. If you can figure out the basics of guitar, then a great deal of the information you learned there will transfer over to the other instruments, and learning them will be a breeze. But playing the other titles before playing this one is like the exact opposite. It's like learning bass before you learn guitar, which... Yeah, some of that information will transfer over, but it is a much more complicated beast. If you can handle what this game throws at you, you'll be able to handle what nearly any other title can throw at you as well. And there's so many different ways to play this one too. It really is one of those RPGs that will let you play however the bloody hell you want to play it. and. You will find a way that works for you eventually. It's gorgeous how fluid and flexible the game design is in this series. Not the most comfortable ride, but if you can handle it, you will be able to appreciate what the rest of the games have to offer so much more. If you think you're up to the challenge, I legit would recommend that you start here. If you can. That having been said, take all the previous stuff I said in mind when playing. Do not at all hesitate to look up guides or YouTube videos or anything at all to help you get stuff figured out. There is no shame in looking up the answers for this series, especially when you cannot figure it out because the game is so weird and esoteric and it doesn't tell you shit. And my god, if someone does give you shit for looking up answers or trying to figure shit out or uh, you you did this, uh, what, what a pleb, fuck them and their stupid limp dick bullshit superiority complex, come dribble. Don't listen to that shit. These are definitely what I would classify as guide games. Honestly, unless you are just addicted to the immersion, Looking up a guide is only gonna help you here, I promise. Just, just don't feel bad. Do what you gotta do to make this series work for you. Oh. See, I said I wasn't gonna go in depth. I said I wasn't gonna go super duper detailed, but oh. because the first game itself is such a kick in the junk, screw it. Top 10 tips for playing the first Dark Souls. We'll do it for just this one game, but yeah, people, let me give you some more specific help with this one. Number one, the best classes for most noobs are probably gonna be the warrior, the knight, the bandit, or the pyromancer. I'll also throw the sorcerer in there, just for those of you who are like me and like to cosplay as Gandalf. I'd also recommend staying away from the thief and the cleric specifically. I mean, yeah, the cleric has some wicked ass spells, but in the first game, it takes you a long ass time to get those to show up. And up until that point, yeah, your ass is gravy. And the thief, well, he starts out with a good item and he's a nimble little spider monkey, but he's piss weak. And see this guy? D don't, don't, don't touch this guy. He's, he's got his own stuff to deal with. You just, you just leave him alone for now. Number two, I'd recommend picking up either the Master Key or the Black Fire Bombs as your starting gift. Some people will give you shit about the Master Key, but 
real talk, it'll save you a few headaches down the line, and it opens up some decent places to grind and get a big amount of souls nice and early. It does kind of sequence break the game a little bit. That's just a fair warning. If you want to play it super safe, just take the black fire bombs because pro tip, the first major bosses you face in this game, super weak to these, crazy weak. Like, neither here nor there. Again, I'm just helping you out. Those of you looking to cheese, who's looking to cheese? Cause the black fire bombs, those are prime Gouda. Who ordered the cheese plate? Number three, once you pick your class, learn what the stats mean and how they're going to help you out when leveling up. Seriously, look up a guide for this. Just don't even kid yourself. Look up a guide for how to level up. If you're going for a big meaty concrete chewing strength build, don't piss away those precious souls into shit like flower picking or advanced crocheting or resistance. In fact, don't, D don't put anything into resistance, no matter what build you're playing. It's it's a waste of time. And also know that when leveling up, most stats have what's called a soft lock, where pouring more levels into them really doesn't help you out that much. For most stats, that's going to be at around between levels 40 and 50. Once you level up past that point, the benefits are so negligent, you may as well not even bother. You might think burning 50,000 souls on one extra point of health is a good investment, but... You're only kidding yourself. Number four, when you find Titanite, use it to upgrade your favorite weapons with it. I wouldn't recommend wasting it on armor, at least not in the early game. You change outfits all the time in this game, so don't waste your precious shiny rocks on something you'll end up feeding to this chungus later. <laughs> Number five, if you die and you had a particularly large amount of souls on you, Whatever bippy bullshit you were doing is officially on hold until you go back to where you died and get those souls back. Head back to the place you got creamed, pick up what you lost, otherwise that is a whole lot of struggle pissed right down the drain. Number six, eventually you're likely to stumble across a key to the undead asylum. You know, the smelly prison where you started the game. There is a way to get back to the undead asylum actually. It's in Firelink Shrine, it requires some wonky platforming, but it's not too hard. You will eventually want to go back to the undead asylum to pick up what's called the rusted iron ring. I cannot stress this enough, you want the rusted iron ring. You really need to pick this fucker up as soon as you can get around to it, and particularly do not go into Blight Town without the rusted iron ring. Believe me, you don't want that pain, so you know, make a trip back home and say hi to your parents. Just, you know, watch the carpet. Number seven, hit every chest before opening it, especially in the late game. Just, just trust me on this, people. Number eight, when you first get to Firelink Shrine, one of the first places you can actually go is a graveyard full of skeletons. Don't do that. They may not have muscles, but trust me, they're way buffer than they look. Basically, follow the stairs and interrupt the zombie frat boy party. That gets you to the first place you wanna be in this game. Number nine, this game is all about stamina management and things like your carrying capacity, the type of armor and equipment you have on, and the points you pour into your endurance stat all affect how your best friend, Mr. Greenbar up there, behaves. Stamina not only affects your dodging, but also how well you block attacks, fire arrows, sprints, just the works. It affects nearly everything in the game. Heavier armor might shield you, but it also means your stamina recharges a lot slower, and that heavy ass hammer you're packing might look like it does a lot of damage, but if you only have the cardio to swing it once or twice, it ain't gonna matter, pumpkin. Endurance. This is a fantastic stat to be upgrading no matter what build you're playing. Four points into that endurance stat. Also neither here nor there, but the chloranthy ring and the grass crest shields are total bros, just throwing that out there. And finally, and most importantly, number 10, just go out there and have fun. I mean, the thing is, chances are, you will make some mistakes your first time playing this game. You'll probably make some 
big fucking mistakes, but don't beat yourself up over it. Once you figure out how to conquer the challenges before you, you will feel outstanding for having conquered them. And like I mentioned earlier, don't be afraid to look up guides. If you do lose a bunch of souls, it's nothing a little bit of grinding won't fix. And one of the best tips I can probably give you here, the thing that's gonna help you the most when you're stumped beyond all stumped, when you're lost without an absolute prayer, SUMMON SPAM! Connect your game online, lay down some helpful sidewalk chalk, and get a good old fashioned bro down throwdown going. Look, I'm not here to judge, I'm here to help. Bro down throwdown! But yeah, people, the original Dark Souls, it's just a classic, even with its weird issues and the obtuse, awkward hurdles you gotta clear with it. It's just something you've got to experience. It is not a perfect game. Honestly, it's pretty far from it, but there's so much about it that's worth admiring and experiencing for yourself that you really should not deny yourself the pleasure if you haven't already. That remastered edition is out for pretty much everything now, so hey, Go for broke people. And remember, always remember, to praise the sun. Dorks. But okay, I get it. You're not in the mood for punishment. You don't want to do the ultra heavy lifting. You don't care about the story or the lore or the poetry or yada, yada, yada. You just want to play something that you know is going to be fun and isn't gonna shove a shoe into your sexual characteristics just getting started with it. Fuck your fanboy bullshit, Crash. Just give me a fun game. Okay. Bloodborne. You want a Souls-like that cuts out almost all of the BS, this is your game, people. A standalone title that isn't connected to any of the Souls canon in like a story or lore way, Bloodborne really does have its own thing going on, but people, that thing is just too good. Bloodborne is probably where a lot of people got their start with the Souls games. It was a massive seller when it dropped, and I feel like the full raging fervor for Souls kind of broke through to the mainstream after this title. And what a title to do it with, too, because Bloodborne, it still holds up, people. Uh, this game in particular was the one for me that allowed me to finally break the wall and start having fun with this series. I'd argue that Bloodborne is probably just outright, like, the best Souls game out there. Just period. Between From or anybody else, Bloodborne is the one that did it right. And it's also an exquisite place to get started with the series, because this game... It just has so little in terms of, like, baggage. Like I mentioned, there's no connection to the Souls lore proper, and it's the only game in its particular series, so there isn't a ton of convoluted shit or references or backtracking that you'll need in order to understand it. The story is very self-contained and graspable. Uh, at least to, like, a certain degree. I mean, it's still weird and unknowable and crazy, but I don't know, as opposed to Dark Souls' edgy D&D shtick, Bloodborne has more of a 17th century European sort of HP Lovecraft by way of Dram Stoker kind of vibe. It's honestly fairly down to earth for a Souls title, while at the same time being way less down to earth. Holy shit. I mean, this game is literally about going insane because of the insight brought onto you by divine knowledge. And holy shit, does this game go to some trippy places. Dark Souls can get confusing, but a fair amount of that is because the game is just really awkward and clumsy in how it hands you information. Bloodborne is also a somewhat confusing game, but it's more because the information being portrayed to you is information that man was never meant to know. Why am I brought
broccoli. If your aesthetic is way less Ren Faire and way more Hot Topic, then Emo Kids, do I have the game for you. But again, it's not just the story and lore that feels streamlined here. The gameplay, too, is just... God, so much less BS than the Souls games. Just real talk, it's so much less. Like, holy cow, Dark Souls, at the end of the day, is an RPG, and man, do they let you know it. With freedom comes variety, and with variety comes holy shit! There are hundreds of weapons in proper Souls games. Like, literally hundreds. And real talk, chances are you'll only get real use out of maybe, like, three to five of these weapons, depending on your build? Hell, you won't even know what 60 to 70% of them even do. Bloodborne? Way simpler. 26. There are a total of 26 weapons in this game, and to be frank, pretty much all of them are useful to at least some degree. All of them have their various strengths and weaknesses. All of them are super fun to use and are very well designed. I mean, barring a few exceptions, most of the stuff you'll get in Dark Souls is like sword, axe, dagger. Meanwhile, Bloodborne is over here like, yeah, we could give you a sword, or we could give you a pizza cutter from hell. Take that, HP Lovecraft. To make up for the lack of weapon variety, the weapons that you do acquire are all super useful and very varied. You can do so much with so little in this game. And every single weapon has at least two different styles of attacking. So you cannot go too wrong here. The first three weapons you pick up in the game are weapons you can play and beat the entire game with. Like, you can start with the saw cleaver and beat the game with the saw cleaver, if that's what you want to do. But if you want to... Yeah, there's also this. The same goes for the armor in this game. Remember my little spiel about how armor in Dark Souls can affect your stamina and how fatty rolling is basically one of the better ways to get yourself killed? Bloodborne? Whatever, dude, just wear what you want. You can't get over encumbered in this game. It ain't about protection. It's about looking dapper as fuck. Bloodborne's playstyle is way more focused on speed, agility, and aggression. So for this game, they basically ditched the weight system altogether. You can just wear whatever the fuck makes your cha-cha slide, homie. None of the clothing is like make or break essential in this game. It's just one less thing you have to worry about. So you know what? strut out in style and dress to express yourself. Seriously, why am I broccoli? Whereas the Dark Souls games proper are more about having tons of options and tons of different ways to approach your various challenges to the point where it's really overwhelming, Bloodborne's approach is way more simplistic. While there are certainly different varieties and builds that you can create in this game, but still, there's still a decent amount of customization in this title. It's not nearly as exhaustive or exhausting as proper Souls games tend to be. And for new players, that's great, because fewer choices and options does mean that there are fewer ways that you can, you know, fuck them up. But I can also make the argument that that could be a legit drawback for some. Again, it's a game that's focused on a much smaller pool of playstyles. In Dark Souls, you can play as a naked spider monkey with a knife, or you can be a megalithic turtle beast who kills people with shields. No, seriously, you can do that. And both playstyles are equally valid and capable styles of play. If you can pull them off, go for it. Bloodborne... Well, not the most restrictive game in the series. <coughs> it does limit your possibilities a bit when compared to its older brothers. This game is all about dodging, rolling, getting your strikes in quick, and getting out of dodge before the unknowable pile of cosmic petroleum jelly can turn you into strawberry preserves. While there are strong style builds in this game, you're never going to be able to turtle up because the game won't let you. This is not a game for you if you believe the best offense is a good defense. You're going to have to get offensive, and you're going to have to play very aggro in order to beat this one. 
But to its credit, the game does have a lot of factors in it that encourage that type of play. Enemies are aggressive as hell, but they often leave you huge parry windows to pop off a nice little shot in the face. It's impossible to get over encumbered, and most weapons more or less have both a quick move set and a strong but slower move set. You can basically switch up your playstyle on the fly. Also, see this? See what's going on with your health bar? Yeah, that's called the rally system. Basically in Bloodborne, when an enemy hits you, your health isn't actually for realsies gone yet. Not until this little line shrinks behind the amount of health you potentially lost. And that bar is... Kind of like DJ Khaled. It's really lazy about going down. So if you do get hit, deck the motherfucker who hits you right back and you can get that health bar to jump right back up where he belongs. People, I mean it. When you play Bloodborne, abuse the fuck out of that rally system. While blood vials are a decent means to get your health back, the best med kit is smacking the motherfucker back. While OG Dark Souls is the daddy of the series, and it'll do a better job of preparing you for future titles, and, you know, on top of that, Bloodborne also has some of its own personal drawbacks, like the load times, having to warp between the Hunter's Dream anytime you want to fast travel anywhere, the completely meaningless and boring Chalice dungeons, seriously, don't even bother with the challenge ch Chalice dungeons, ugh. Uh, they're not even worth saying, right? Plus the little nitpick that the only thing you can play this game on is this thing. Come on, Sony, let us have a PC port. If you're gonna put this thing on PC, you can at least give us this too. But people, if you want the most fun, spooky, twisted, and absolutely wonderful as all hell title to get your feet wet and to get you acclimatized with how these games work and give you what's probably the most undiluted, straight up good ass time you can have with a Souls game, Bloodborne is the game for you. Fear the old blood. Those are the two games that I just have to recommend you try first. They are wonderful titles, and I would sincerely hope you're willing to give one of those two a try. Just, they are so worth it. But I also understand that even they have things about them that could potentially keep people away. Dark Souls 1 is just... Oh no! A fucking beast! And Bloodborne is so limited in its playstyle, and it's only on one console that is about to be outdated by the end of the year. Like, yeah, talk about a fucking barrier to entry. But let's say you're in the middle. You want to get into the Souls games proper, but you don't want to get your ass handed to you on a silver platter, and you don't want to sell your soul to Sony just so you can play a game that you might not even potentially like, you know? What's the title for me? How can I get into this series? Dark Souls 3. If you don't want to break your face open by playing Dark Souls 1 proper, then my recommendation is to actually take this series in reverse order instead. Play 3, then play 2, then play 1. It's going to be much more of an easy road for you. If you can't handle the first game, then you can kind of ease yourself into the other game's more difficult challenges by weaning yourself onto it gradually by working backwards. Again, a lot of these games made drastic quality of life improvements with each successive title, and Dark Souls 3 is where a lot of those quality of life changes all come together and meet up in one specific game. This is probably the most accommodating game of the original series, and it's the one title you can play that'll help you see what the hype is about with this series without too many emergency room visits. Because in my opinion, and this is only my opinion, please remember that, this is a decent game to get started with the series in, because Dark Souls 3 is probably the easiest one. I... I, I okay. 
Alright, go ahead! One of the biggest things to note about this game is that Hidetaka Miyazaki, the father and creator of the Soul series, was making Bloodborne at around the same time he was developing this game. And believe me, it shows. There is a lot of Bloodborne rub-off with this title. From the creature designs, to the story and lore, right down to the style of play. To me, this game kinda hits that sweet spot between Dark Souls and Bloodborne. So, if you don't have a PS4, or if you just have to start with something Souls proper, but need a bit of hand-holding in the meantime, look, this game is probably going to be your best bet. There are a lot of quality of life improvements to this game over the first couple of ones. You can warp between any bloody bonfire you wish, thank god, and other little nitpicks from previous titles just flat out don't show up here. Weapon degradation and the constant backtracking are basically gone, I mean, instead of roaming around the whole map looking for vendors and blacksmiths who can fucking do the thing you need them to do. All the goddamn commuting you do in this game, the commuting! A good chunk of that is gone. Most of the people you need to help you out are either already waiting for you in Firelink Shrine, or will basically head straight there once you find them out in the world. You don't need to traipse between 20 different areas just to find the guy who does the thing I need. And in addition to that, there's also the new weapon art system, which gives almost all of your weapons a new edge in combat. And these moves also put your new magic meter to use. Yeah, in most of the previous games when you utilized magic, each spell only had a specific number of charges. And outside of a few very specific circumstances, the charges you got on a spell, that's your lot. No more. You are getting four soul spears, and if you don't like it, you can choke on my- In this game, your magic abilities draw from a pool instead of being limited to a number of casts. So, even if you're not playing a magic build, your weapon arts can draw from this reserve. So no matter what build you're going for, you can still get something out of using the magic in this game. In other Souls titles, if you aren't a magic-specific build, magic is... kinda useless? It's cool that they opened it up like that. Also, I just gotta say, a lot of the bosses in this one, while I wouldn't call them easier, I would say that they're more straightforward. They all have various patterns and can mix things up on you in cool and unexpected ways. Jesus! But once you figure out their patterns, none of them are too outlandish to handle. There aren't too many bosses in this game that are like, cheap, or like, goofy. Every boss has their own strengths and weaknesses, and it feels like you don't have to cheese them or abuse them or just get lucky to make them go down. You can beat these guys with a legitimate strategy. With the exception of maybe Yorm the Giant, but I don't really care because that fight still feels epic and fun and absolutely timeless, especially if you do all the side quests for Sigurd. Like I said, people, you find an onion, you help that onion. You help that onion boy! Onions! But like Bloodborne, the game also feels a lot more streamlined. It has a much more natural flow and progression to it than other previous titles. And again, the quality of life improvements and other nifty new features they've added to the series from learning their mistakes across four previous games, all meet up together in this title and deliver a very satisfying, challenging, fairly well-balanced, and ultimately gorgeous conclusion to the series. I mean, side note, but yeah, check out some of this game's environments. Like, this is probably one of the prettiest games in the series, hands down, and it really does feel like a good conclusion to the series. I was honestly tempted to include this game as a must-play because of just how accommodating and comfortable it can be. You know, it won't destroy your ass in places, but it still feels like a feasible challenge. If you need another game to help ease you into this series, again, this isn't a squishy squishy boy, but I can recommend it. Like, this is another one of those games that will be more kind to you. But that having been said, ugh, its whole 
accommodating nature is also why I decided to keep it off the must plays, believe it or not. Again, hear me out on this. Yeah, the game is accommodating, but at times it can almost feel too accommodating. All of these quality and life improvements do make the game way easier, but well, part of the fun of past Souls games was exploring the world and unlocking all its nifty secrets and shortcuts. While there still is a fair amount of that in the game, yikes, is this game way more linear than a lot of the other titles. Even Bloodborne, with its more streamlined approach, still had environments designed with lots of twists, turns, and secrets that opened up the map in unique and interesting ways. Dark Souls 3? Eh. You just aren't really given much of a reason to backtrack or to get to learn the environments too terribly thoroughly. The world doesn't so much open up as it does kind of lazily unfold. You go from place to place, you pick up the items, you beat the boss, and then you move on. They are pretty and very gorgeous and stylistic environments, but once you've gone through them once and have done what you need to do in each area, you aren't often given a lot of incentive to come back. There isn't as much fun and interesting stuff to uncover. You aren't backtracking in this game to pick up on an exciting new secret that's opened up to you now after exploring and finding new items and keys and entrances. You're backtracking because, ah oh shit, I forgot to let the pyromancer out of his cage, shit. You wanna go for walkies? And while I do appreciate the ability to warp between bonfires and the generous amounts of bonfires overall, like, wow, they overdid it in a couple of places. I mean, look at this. Look at this. This bonfire is still here. It's been four years. How has this not been patched out? It's a more beautiful world, but overall, there are less things to do in it. It's still not bad level design by any means, but compared to the previous games, it does feel like a bit of a step down. The accommodation factor to help draw in new players does kinda take away from the wow factor the other games can present to you. This game is much less punishing, but the things they took away also happen to be the things that helped make the games interesting, and it's less interesting as a result. That extends to the combats and gameplay as well. While it's more accommodating, it's just not as interesting as in other games. Uh, for one, I'll just say what everyone says about this game. Holy shit, does this game favor the night build? Like for real, people, I, if you want to play this game and just win like a motherfucker, play the night. None of the other classes are absolutely borked, I'd say, but uh, god, this game feels like it was designed to be a night game first, and everything else was just uh, minor details. It speaks to a bit of a weird flaw this series has, in that the later games have this tendency to focus on only very specific types of play, as opposed to the first few titles where, you know, they were so free and open-ended, almost anyone's approach could work. This game, and I'd also say Bloodborne and Sekiro, all feel like they really favor just one or two specific builds over all the others. But Bloodborne and Sekiro are specifically designed with that idea in mind. Those are limited on purpose. Dark Souls 3, you still have the option to play as all the other boys. You're just probably not gonna have as good of a time if you do. It feels like the reason this was done was specifically because the knight is one of the most simple builds you can play in this game. But in other games, the sheer amount of options and different play styles and things you could just experiment and goof around with were a big part of its appeal. It was that wow factor of trying something new out and discovering that, oh, you can do that? But this game, in order to be more accommodating, had to sacrifice some of those elements that 
you know, brought Dazzle to the older titles, which is kind of a shame. And like I mentioned earlier, if you want to start with this game, it can kind of dull the impact that the other games will have on you. Certain story beats and moments won't have quite the same impact if you catch them here before you've had the proper setup built up in other games. So if you start with this game and you do decide you want to go back and try out the others, you can get absolutely creamed in them because Daddy Dark Souls 3 kind of spoils you rotten and you won't know how to handle the world's real problems when the earlier games decide to hand them to you. Seriously, try playing this game and then go into Demon Souls. I fucking dare ya. Overall, what it makes up for in accessibility and presentation, it kind of lacks in audacity boldness, and raw skill development. It can deaden the effect other titles in the series can have on you. It certainly did that to me. Looking back on it, yeah, I really wish I had started with Dark Souls 1 first. I started with Bloodborne and Dark Souls 3, and as a result, playing the other games was way harder than it had to be because I had to unlearn a lot of the stuff that those first two games taught me. If you can, I'm just saying if you can muster it, I would sincerely tell you to start with Dark Souls 1 proper because it'll just be so much easier to immerse yourself in the world and it'll just give you the thick skin you need to survive. But hey, even that didn't end up ruining the series for me, I still grew to love these games, so if you just got to, neither of these are a bad place to start. And then there's Dark Souls 2. The weird one. Dark Souls 2, man, where do you even start with this one? This is probably the most contentious title in the entire series. You do see a lot of people out there who outright hate this game for all the weird changes it made to the formula, but then you can just as easily find people who love this game. There are many who pick this to be their favorite out of the entire series, specifically for those weird new steps it took. There is some middle ground, but the general vibe I get is that this is one of those games that people either love or hate. So where do I stand? Sorry people, but we do not accept that Dark Souls 2 hate in this house. This is a pro Dark Souls 2 house. We love our weird little Dark Souls boy. I love this game. I love it, love it, love it. It might be like kind of a personal favorite for me. I just, there's so much about this game that I love. But I also kind of get it. Those of you that ain't fans of this game, I'm not out to get ya because, yeah, it, it's got some weirdness to it. It's just kind of a weird game. This was one of the only proper games in the canon Soul series to not be directed by Hidetaka Miyazaki. At the time, he was actually caught up working on Bloodborne, but Dark Souls ended up being a kind of surprise gangbusters success, so FromSoft wanted a sequel like right quick. So Miyazaki took on more of a supervisory role, while a different team hammered away at this game. And as a result, it's a bit of a different animal. It's quirky. Everything about this game is just quirky. It's got a quirky health system, a quirky map layout, it has quirky bosses, quirky environments, quirky NPCs. Like, even for Dark Souls, a series that can be quirky just in and of itself, this game, it's got that little bit extra quirk to it. This is quirky even for a Dark Souls title. While the rest of the titles have this overwhelming sense of separation and otherness from the world, you know, that feeling of being in a completely unknowable situation and not really amounting to much more than a flake of dust on the great big book of fucked up history that is this game's lore, this game, in its own ways, it feels more like a personal story. The opening cinematic, a very gorgeous opening cinematic too, if I might add. God damn, this is beautiful. 
Uh, but it's all about you. All of the NPCs seem to take a much more sincere interest in what you're doing, and the ultimate endgame is about you taking up the responsibility of this world yourself. And the old crones... You lose your souls. All of them. Over and over again. Oh man, they're really out to get you. They, they hate your fucking guts. <laughs> I love them. The narrative, in its own way, feels more like a personal journey, and there are lives here that do depend on the choices you ultimately make. Even if in the end, it... There's just something so much more human and engaging with this game's narrative. Again, it's not directly connected to any of the other titles. You don't need to play any of the others to understand essentially what's going on, but having played the original Dark Souls will again clue you into some interesting details about the world and just how fucked up their situation really is. It's a detail that no other Souls game has really tried to this extent, and I honestly appreciate it. I also appreciate this game's design. Man, this is where the Souls games really start to hit their stride, in my opinion. This is basically where the team looked at all the tortuous backtracking you had to do, threw it all in the garbage, and said, you know what, people? Treat yourself. Here's a lovely little hub with a fantastic view and the series' best waifu material. This is your home base, this is your hub, come here to improve your gear, buy spells, buy armor, buy healing items, relax, chill, take it easy, whatever you need we got you fam, we're like Walmart, only slightly less depressing. It does still have some of that old school backtrack bullshit, particularly when you want to upgrade to the super weapons or try to sell off your gear that you don't need anymore, I swear to god. God, I can never find this Chungus when I actually need him. But the bullshit factor has been severely cut down from the first game. And again, it's way more newbie friendly, in its own weird way at least. This is way more newbie friendly than the first game. Combat is also very well balanced in this game, with nearly every build contributing to a perfectly valid and valuable playstyle. This game is pretty flexible and it tends to work well with a lot of different builds. The addition of healing gems is also a great way to take care of your health that I wish they would brought over into other games. Like, this is the one thing about this game a lot of people slag, but I love the healing gems. Like, why do people hate this? These things save my ass constantly in the game. There are also some wonderfully unique set pieces and ideas that only this game possessed. And God damn it, even for all its eccentricities, I just love the hell out of this title. It does not deserve a fair amount of the hate it gets, and I'm almost tempted to say that it really does hit that sweet spot between accessibility and challenge that neither Dark Souls 1 or 3 achieves. It's not too ball busty, but it's also not too hand holdy. For me at least, it's just right. But it does get hate, and to be fair, at least in some places, I totally understand because, whoa, can this game fuck you over if you don't play it right? For example, there's now a system where if you end up killing enemies in an area over and over again, eventually they'll just stop respawning altogether. That probably sounds good on paper. If you're killing enemies over and over again, you're obviously having trouble with the section. They're gone. You don't have to deal with them anymore, right? Well, no, when they disappear, that means you can't grind them anymore. Grinding, as much as I kind of hate to admit it, is kind of a staple of the Souls series. You don't necessarily have to grind if you're good at the game, but if you're not, yeah, you're gonna be doing some grinding. But Dark Souls 2 actually limits the amount of grinding you're capable of doing. When they disappear, the souls you need to rake up to get buff and counteract all the shit that's getting thrown at you yeah, they disappear, so you can't farm anymore. You see what I mean? Oh, that kinda sucks. If you're really bad at the game, there are items you can find that do make the enemies come back, but the problem is they'll come back even stronger. Meaning that if you were having trouble with a particular area, it just became a whole lot more 
troublesome. You know what I mean? This is definitely a game that punishes you a bit more for poor play. But there's also a new system here for reversing hollowing. Ah, uh, sh oh, shit, I haven't mentioned how hollowing works yet, have I? Um, look, without getting into the Fextra Life version of things, hollowing in Dark Souls is basically like a penalty state that you get put in upon death. It kind of sucks, and it really sucks in Dark Souls 2 in particular. In Dark Souls 1, all that going hollow meant was that you couldn't summon and you looked like you got hit with every branch of the ugly stick. And in Dark Souls 3, there isn't even really technically a hollow state. I, I know there is, yes, but uh, look, shut up. I'm trying to keep this concise. In Dark Souls 2, though, ugh. Every time you die, you lose a chunk of your health bar. Get killed? Well, guess what? You're coming back with even less health to fix all the mistakes you made. You can lose up to 50% of your damn health bar if you keep dying over and over again. And this is a game that loves to kill you over and over again. And God, that's if you were a good little boy running around and not doing naughty things. If you do certain actions like kill NPCs and generally just act like a vicious little bastard, your health bar can be cut down as far as Jesus Christ, are you serious? And the amount of human effigies, the thing that actually reverts hollowing and gets your health bar back to where it should be are somewhat limited in this game. You can farm them in certain ways, but the drop rates are not good. And remember what I said about killing enemies, how it makes them disappear after a while, so farming is really hard. Yeah, oops. Dark Souls 2 is no walk in the park, and you can find yourself dying a hell of a lot in this game. I'd argue this is one of the hardest titles in the series, and if you happen to be particularly bad at it, it can kick your ass so hard that it'll come damn close to unplayable. So yeah, while I personally have a soft spot for this one, I understand y'all's frustration, and as a result of some of these factors, I really can't recommend this as a first title. Come to this one after you've been more acclimatized to the series. I would not recommend starting here at all. It is a wonderful game that plays fantastically, looks gorgeous, and has one of the most engaging narratives of the entire series. But man, this game really makes you earn that treats more than any other game in the series, I'd argue. And yeah, there's some ideas that came out of this game that frankly, I'm glad didn't cross over into other titles. Definitely one to seek out eventually, but just, again, how to get into is about accessibility. It's about how well a newbie is going to handle this particular game. And you know, Dark Souls 2, as much as I love it, as much fun as it is, starting here, I'm just saying, if you're bad at it, this game is even more punishing than Dark Souls 1, so, you know, just be careful. I'd play at least a few other games before you dip into this, but definitely, definitely give it a shot. I love Dark Souls 2. And remember, save up those human effigies, dude, because you're gonna need them. So those are the games I'd recommend everyone check out, at least at some point. All of them offer something that can get you hooked and make you respect the sheer brilliance behind these titles. But while the Souls games do have many titles that are absolutely wonderful, there are a few out there that... <sighs> Look, even if they aren't bad games, I don't think this series has a bad game in it. Some titles, ooh, they create a bigger barrier to entry than others. Remember people, how to get into's are not like ranked lists. Just because something is slow here doesn't mean it's bad, it just means there might be issues with it that could cause someone to bounce right off of this series. And man, as much as I hate to say it, I cannot think of a game that has as much potential bounce off effect than Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. Like Dark Souls 2, Sekiro is 
weird, especially when we talk about it in terms of other Souls games. Hot take? I'm not even entirely sure this game counts. I know, but hear me out. I mean, yeah, a lot of the typical deciding factors of Souls games are present. It is a third-person action title. It's published by From Software directly, directed by Hidetaka Miyazaki, and yes, it is focused primarily on melee combat and stamina management. But as far as Souls likes go, this game is probably the least like any other Souls game out there. Even when compared to Souls likes that aren't from From Software, again, that's so awkward to say. It's doing something very different from the typical formula. Very, very different. For one, it actually has a pretty coherent and non-esoteric narrative. Whereas other Souls games are all about getting lost in the throes of a dying world, or being a pawn in a game between unknowable forces of divine terror, this game... Eh. You're a shinobi. Your master gets kidnapped. Go get him. It does get more intriguing than that later, to be fair, but it never really rises above, like, kinda sorta trippy samurai flick. Hell, you can't even roleplay in this game, not really, because you have a character. And while you do get to make some choices in the narrative, it's not like even mildly as deep as other Souls games, or even Bloodborne could get. It's very straightforward, and it has a very narrow focus. The depth to this game is just a paddling pool compared to its forebears. And that goes for the combat, too. In this game, you have the choice between using a katana and... Fuck you, here's your katana. That's all you get in this game. There are little sub-weapons you can use in combat, and they can help in certain situations, but as far as weapon choice, combat variety, there almost is none. This is it. You sword, or you fuck off. And I thought Bloodborne was limited with its 26 weapons. Yikes! It's not just the weapons, though. Combat itself is also very, very restrictive. See, one of the appeals of Souls Combat is, while it isn't necessarily the most complicated thing out there, I mean, you're not gonna be doing, like, Street Fighter, Tekken-level juggle, but there are still a lot of different ways you can approach combat in these games. You can be defensive and use shields and heavy armor. You can be nimble and quick and use daggers and dodges. You can attack from long distance with magic and arrows. Even in Bloodborne, you still had the ability to choose between being a slicey boy, a smashy girl, or that weirdo who constantly exercises his Second Amendment rights. Every game up to this point had many different strategic approaches to combat. In this game, though, it's learn to parry or eat shit. I'm serious, people. This game is all about parrying. You have to master the art of timing your opponent's techniques and bashing them away at just the right second in order to get your counterattack in. Hell, the entire combat system is built around the parrying. You not only lower opponent's health, but you also attack their posture and poise in hopes that you'll be able to open them up and take advantage with a counter move. You have to master the art of parrying in this game. And people, I always sucked at parrying. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, I know this is just a me gripe at this point, but I hate parrying. I'm terrible at it. I've never been able to master the timing. I can't parry in Souls games. I can barely parry in Bloodborne and they let you do it from like, 50 feet away! It's not the way I play these games. I can't do it. Maybe I got slow reflexes. Maybe I'm just a big dum-dum, but I can not do it. But the thing is, up until this game, I never 
had to do it if I didn't want to. There may have been enemies or situations in other games where it certainly would have helped, but I was never locked into that one play style. There was always some kind of workaround in every other game because every other game catered to different styles of play. Sekiro? There's only one way to play this game. You parry... Yeah. ...or you dead. But you know, I've heard from people who are more able to adjust to that particular style of play, and they say that if you can master it, the game is an absolute blast. Apparently this game is like Bloodborne level good if you can get into it. You know, I'd say at least give it a try for sure. Who knows, this could be an absolute hidden gem for you. But like, oh, just, just on principle, there are a lot of things that can potentially make this game just torture. It can be so inaccessible if you aren't a specific kind of player. The severely limited combat, the rigidly structured story and narrative, the almost complete lack of role-playing. Even though there are a lot of things about this game that make it feel like a Souls game, there's so much that also doesn't, you know? This thing, to me at least, just does not feel like a Souls game. I mean, if anything, this game isn't so much a Souls game as it is... Well, this is reaching a little far back, but anyone remember Tenchu? Yeah, Tenchu. Who remembers that series? That's a bit of an old dog. 3D ninja stealth games. You likely caught one of these back in the PS1 or PS2. That is also a FromSoft property, and to be honest, there are parts of Sekiro that remind me so much of Tenchu, it's crazy. Those games also had a big emphasis on stealth, you totally could not brute force the combat in them, and the story was also very Japanese folklore-y. If anything, Sekiro plays more like an updated version of a Tenchu game than an outright Souls game, and that is not just me talking out of my ass either, because this game actually started life as a potential pitch for a Tenchu revival. I mean, you see it all over this game, too. If you played or loved any of the old Tenchu games, then by all means, yes, you really do need to pick this one up. This is basically Super Tenchu Alpha Plus. If that appeals to you, or if you're a certain kind of gamer, then yeah, this game probably kicks ass. But as a Souls title? I mean, yeah, making the comparison just doesn't even feel fair, right? What this game is doing is so very different from your typical Souls game vibe. It's got its own distinctive style, narrative, and its gameplay is only accessible to a much narrower scope of people. This is not a game that everyone is going to like. Judged by the standards of the other Dark Souls games, I mean, yeah, this one kind of falls below the bar a bit, if I'm being honest, you know? But judged solely on its own merits, as a third-person action game, in a more general sense, I mean, it's gorgeous, combat is very fluid and satisfying, if you can get into it, and there's definitely enough here to more than satisfy the type of gamer who would love this kind of style, but it is so severely niche that I can only recommend this to a small selective group of players. And as an introduction to the Dark Souls series, pfft, yeah, no, no, do not play this in that regard, man. Dark Souls plays very little like this game, but hey, for what it is, the people who will enjoy this it is a good time, and you know, it's worth a try to just see if you bounce off of it. I will not be surprised at all if you do. Honestly, I still haven't beaten this game. I haven't even gotten very far in it. It's just, I can't parry. But if this sounds like something up your alley, believe me, if you can get into this, you will still enjoy the ride. But you know, my gripes with this game, they're mostly just, 
my gripes. It's obviously a title that doesn't cater to my specific playstyle and tastes. I would say it's still a good game for the people who will be able to get into it. It's just not doing a thing that appealed to me, and it's not doing a thing that will appeal to everyone. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with catering to one niche and giving them the best possible game you can give them. It's a good game. It's just not my type of game. Demon Souls, on the other hand... I'm gonna be as nice as I can to this title, because again, no, this is not at all a bad game. This is honestly one of the most important games in the entire franchise. This is the game that basically started it all. But man, people, time has not been kind to this one. And again, that doesn't feel like a fair judgment. Not only is the game over 10 years old at time of writing, but this was also their first real crack at it. Originally envisioned as a successor to the Kingsfield series of games, this project basically languished in development hell in Frum's offices for a fairly long time, and it was on the brink of full-blown cancellation before a young coder who had done a lot of work on Frum's Armored Core series said he'd be willing to take up the project himself if he could have total creative control. Since this particular bomb was about to explode anyway, Frum said, eh, sure, go nuts. What, what else could possibly go wrong with this? One thing led to another, and now... <laughs> the fact that the game even exists at all is kind of a small miracle, and the fact that it became such a huge critical success is an even bigger miracle. This game basically lays the foundation for what would become an entire new genre of games. But in some respects, the game has aged like fine... milk. Oh, see, that's the thing about this game. Other Souls titles have perfected the formula. Even Dark Souls 1 has it nailed down to a degree. But that particular formula was brand spanking new in Demon Souls, and... Well, yeah, your first try is often the... borkiest, but man... Does Demon Souls have some bork to it? For one, even if you did decide you wanted to try this game, my god, do you have to jump through a lot of hoops to even get to it? This game is a PS3 exclusive. Sony owns the publishing rights, and there have been no other ports, no other releases. Well, as of yet anyway, don't worry, we'll get to it. If you want to play Demon Souls, you're gonna have to dust off your old black monolith and play it on this thing. Thankfully, boxed copies still go for fairly reasonable prices, and it is still on the PS3 online store, so... Thank God it's not like a lost or a rare game or anything like that. It's just... You know, old. And crusty. And I don't mean just physically, either. Yikes, people. I'm just gonna come right out and say it. This game has some jank. From janky controls, to janky mechanics, to janky balancing, to janky graphics and presentation, this game is... flawed. Even if you are familiar with other Souls titles, there are some things about this game that can still throw you off. For one, the old bonfire checkpoint system is here, but it's... Weird. The way they work in this game is that you basically have to run through an entire level and beat the boss before you're allowed to have another checkpoint. Usually in other Souls games, you'll often get a little bit of a breather bonfire outside or at least somewhere near the boss so you aren't traipsing your fat ass across the entire map just to get another shot at progression. But here, nope. Do it all and like it, you scrub. There's also no Estus in this game. Ah, shit, I haven't mentioned how that works either. Um, 
Estus is basically your little healing juice that gets charged up at every bonfire when you rest. Anytime you rest at a bonfire in another Souls game, you also top off your little Capri Sun pouch and move on your merry way. Demon Souls actually uses a system that's more in line with what Bloodborne uses, i.e. their health pickups you find in the world, and you basically use those as healing. The problem is, this healing system is both the best and the worst thing in the goddamn world. But what I mean is, if you're having an especially shitty time trying to get through an area, you can find yourself chewing through all your precious grass reserves and get stuck wandering around the level farming for lovely healing salad. Ugh. That sounds like fun, doesn't it? Trust me, it's not. Seriously, the way you cut grass in this game, it should be called Yardwork Simulator 2009. But on the other side of the coin, if you don't mind the grind, you can basically just keep farming and farming and farming for all eternity and lug around so much grass that Snoop Dogg will never leave you alone. You can basically just heal tank your way through any of the challenges the game might throw at you. Like I said, the game has some very weird balancing issues, and that is certainly one of them. It speaks to how fumbly bumbly this first attempt was. They hadn't worked out a lot of the kinks just yet, and let me tell ya, this here is quite the motherfucking kink. There's also the weird way that this game handles difficulty. Holy shit. This game has a lovely little system called World Tendency, and... Oh god. Uh, like I said, I don't have time to go into huge detail in these videos. Uh, this video is already fucking long enough as it is. But oh my god. World Tendency. I don't even know where to begin explaining this to you. It's basically this complicated as hell system that adjusts how difficult enemies are and how strong you are to fight back against them. But it's super duper complicated. You need all kinds of charts and shit. But the simplest way I can break it down for you is basically, the more you die, the harder this game gets. You keep dying over and over again, the game punishes you by making the game harder. Now, now hang on, hang on, run with me here. You keep dying because the game is too hard, so the game remedies the situation by making it harder. Do you see a flaw in this logic? World Tendency is just one of those things that will just completely put a dick in your chicken sandwich. And the game does an awful job of telling you how it works. Again, it feels like one of those concepts that probably made for an interesting elevator pitch, but was really poorly bungled in the execution. Hell, World Tendency is even tied to whether or not you play online? Seriously, which is especially dickish because as of 2018, the servers for Demon Souls are no longer up. Yeah, there is no online for this game anymore. So yeah, one of the bigger selling features to these games, the online capabilities. Yep, you're just shit out of luck with this one. Offline only or get the fuck out. But even taking all that in mind, I still wouldn't say it's a bad game, not at all. It's just one that's been ravaged by the passing of time and the better games that have come out in its wake. It's hard to dig up, some of its primary selling features don't even work anymore, and it's by far the most clunky, most unpolished, roughest gem in this series. But it is still a gem. This game also has one of the better single narratives the series has, and it has some outstanding boss encounters and many memorable moments that do merit the acclaim that it has gotten over the years. It is a genuinely good, if not great game. But again, this is a how to get into. The idea is accessibility, and this game... It might be the least accessible in the entire series. It's a damn decent game though, even with all its jank. You just really do not want to start here. Honestly, I wouldn't come around to this game until you are good and hardened with the rest of the Souls series. This game will probably be the greatest test of your abilities. 
At least that's what I would say until... Yeah, y'all knew I was gonna have to tackle this, right? I took so long writing this damn script that this baby got announced. And you know what? It looks great. And Blue Point Games are handling the remaster and they've done some outstanding work. So yeah, I bet this will be really cool. I'll totally play this when it drops. I'll even try to get a review in if I can. I don't know, we'll see how this one turns out. Honestly, I'm hype. But please be more than just a graphical update, though. Like, people, I'm glad this is happening, but look, the OG game has so many other features outside of its graphics. Blue Point, please, please put some quality of life improvements in there. Please, pretty please, don't be purists, I beg you. Please cure the jank. So, yeah, that's Team Souls. Yeah, that's the entire series. Am I, I'm not missing anything, right? No, yeah, that's all of them. Well, the video isn't done yet, and we've still got one more section to go. What are we going to talk about? Oh no, you can't be serious. I know what you're thinking. I know exactly where your head's at. I know your crimes. You either heard about this series from a friend or read about it in a Souls-related article or saw it in a video or whatever, and you thought to yourself, Kingsfield? What's that? People, I, look, I'll keep this nice and simple. You probably don't want to play Kingsfield, like, legit, unless you have very, very specific tastes. Just don't play Kingsfield. Save yourself the trauma. Though while these games aren't exactly the most playable these days, the Kingsfield series does still have some interesting history behind it. Did you know that the first Kingsfield was actually From Software's first developed game? Yeah, they were founded all the way back in 1986, believe it or not, but back then they only worked in productivity software primarily. That was up until around 1994 when they decided to branch out with this game, one of the first RPGs ever to come out on the original Sony PlayStation in 1994. Those of you that remember your history know that the US PlayStation didn't come out until 1995, and the original Kingsfield didn't even get localized over here, so for the first game at least, that's a huge hurdle to have to climb over right from the get-go. The first game in the series that we got in the West was actually Kingsfield 2 which they sold over here as Kingsfield 1, even though it's not technically, it makes the whole canon like Final Fantasy fucked up. Uh, God, how am I not even past the introduction? And we've already got like so many hurdles to introduction to these games. Like, wow, people. Yeah, these are rough. <sighs> Here's the thing with Kingsfield. For their time, they were actually pretty innovative and cool. These games were completely rendered in 3D from a first-person perspective, and not only that, you can technically consider these open-world RPGs as there is no linear progression to them. You can basically tackle any area you bloody well please and play the game in any order you want. Again, for 1994, that was hella ambitious. Hell in Kingsfield 2, that's this Kingsfield 2, not this King, God. Hell, if you know what you're doing, you can get to the final boss in less than 40 minutes. You can practically book it straight to him. I'm just saying, we gave Breath of the Wild so many blowjobs for being able to do that, but here's Kingsfield 25 years ahead of the curve. For 1995 at least, this is crazy impressive. There weren't many games up to this point that had accomplished the feats that this series had. It is worth praising in that regard. From like a pure historical perspective, these games are very interesting. 
but like, as games? I mean, you're looking at the same footage I am, right? Yeesh. Good lord, and I gave Demon Souls shit for aging poorly. <laughs> Sorry, Boo, I hope that remake does you up real nice. But, oh my god, just look at this game. You move like you're in molasses, everything looks like it's made of melted Lego, everything kills you in like two hits. <laughs> if you're lucky. And to add to the fun, the controls. Oh god, the controls. This is a 3D game made before the advent of twin sticks. The twin sticks have become such a vital aspect to controlling 3D games these days, but before the invention of those little knobs, game designers had to get creative. I mean, again, it's just one of those things you do kind of have to admire in its own way. This was 3D gameplay done two years before Mario 64. How the hell did they even handle this? Well, you look up and down with the shoulder buttons, and your other two shoulder buttons also act as strafe buttons. Again, to be as fair to the game as I can, in 1994, this style was actually an elegant solution to the problem. It's about as best that you can hope to do on a controller that has no analog control. But playing these games in 2020, Oh, it just feels so weird, people. It is so weird to play like this. They were important and damn interesting games for their time, but man, they just have not aged well. They are archaic as hell, but at the time, they were bold and innovative titles. And you can even see how some of the faint traces of this game would go on to serve as influence to the Soul series as a whole. The interconnected nature of the map, the minimalistic and esoteric nature of the storytelling, the thrill of exploring a new environment, the stamina-based combat. There's even a few things that pop up in these games that would go on to become Soul series staples. Stuff like Seath the Dragon and the Moonlight Sword. They got their start here in Kingsfield. As pieces of history, they do make interesting trivia. And if you happen to be that weirdo that loves dusty, busted ass, old antique 3D games, then hey, there's plenty in here to get nostalgic about. But I can really only recommend these games as just that, nostalgia. And even then, I'd still recommend you just fire them up in an emulator, abuse the hell out of the save states, and just Walk through them more like you would a museum exhibit than a game. It's interesting and educational. But is it fun? I wouldn't necessarily whip this out at parties, if you know what I mean. And there you have it. That's my little walk through the Souls series. I know these games can be brutal, and they've pretty much been brutal from day one, but they are so deep, so intriguing, and so endlessly replayable. At the end of the day, they are just some of the most fun you can have in gaming if you can break through the wall. But hopefully, I've been able to help you figure out which one of these titles might be for you, which ones might be better to check out a little further down the line, and whether or not the series as a whole sounds like something you'd be interested in. Honestly, people, these games... They are very strange, but they are very wonderful, and please remember, at the end of the day, this is just my personal opinion. Don't take anything I've said here as gospel. Just go out there and try some of them for yourself. You will die and die and die and die and die and die and die. But you will have so many wonderful experiences along the way that will make it feel like it was all worth it in the end. And I hope you have fun taking on the challenges. Again, thank you very much for watching. If you like what you see, feel free to hit that subscribe button and ring the bell while you're at it. In the meantime, though, I'm Crash Thompson, and I'll see you in the next video. Something special, thanks to